Matthew chapter, let's make it 12. In chapter 12, everything starts to change in the ministry of Jesus in, in the gospel according to Matthew. And all of a sudden, from here to the end of the book, the religious leaders, those that are opposing him, are going to become more and more hostile uh, toward him. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day when they tried to find fault with his disciples for uh, taking the wheat grain and sifting it in their hands and blowing away the chaff and eating it, and they tried to find fault with him for healing on the Sabbath day. And Jesus identified the problem with their interpretation of God's Sabbath law. And he said, what you need to do is you need to remember mercy and not just sacrifice. And they had ceased to move, put into the equation of their interpretation of God's word, the mercy of God. And so he uh, defends his disciples as they eat on the Sabbath day he, and, uh, and eat of the grain. He defends his own freedom as the Son of God to heal on the Sabbath day. And the result in verse 14 of chapter 12 was that the Pharisees went out and they glorified God, you know, for all of the great things that Jesus was doing. That's not what they did. They went out and they took counsel against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he called fire down from heaven and slaughtered every single one of them. No, <laughs> this isn't a gospel about me. This is a gospel about the Lord. So when Jesus knew it, and his response is interesting, really, he withdrew from there. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all on the Sabbath day. And he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. They didn't want to hear him. Uh, the religious leaders didn't. They wanted to oppose him. Uh, they were no longer honest in their assessment of him or his truth. And so what did he do? He said, fine, I'll go to people who want to hear. And I'll go to bruised reeds that need me and are willing to listen. And I'll go to smoking flaxes. And I'll make sure that the hope in their life isn't completely snuffed out. And I'll restore hope to them. And it, very often, the great tendency, and if the devil can peg us as a person who will run around forever defending ourselves or coming against every person that comes against us as we simply walk with the Lord and obey his call upon our life, then that's what we'll spend the rest of our lives doing. And so Jesus models for us, just leave them to what they're doing, focus upon God's call upon our lives, and move forward and keep on doing it. And that's what Jesus does. He is, uh, as the servant of the Lord, as he's described here in uh, Isaiah, uh, by Isaiah the prophet, prophet that is quoted here by Matthew, he's the servant of God just quietly going on about his business. In other words, Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah came and met the kind of reaction that Jesus met, that this would be his response. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. Uh, the rejection of man never changes uh, God's or heaven's assessment of Jesus. It never changes the truth about him. He is my servant, the Father says, whom I have chosen. My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. And I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall will declare justice to the Gentiles. And he will not quarrel nor cry out. He won't fight with these guys. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He won't call for a revolution against them. But instead, he'll give his attention to the bruised reed, which he will not break, and the smoking flax, which he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. And so Jesus continued now to fulfill the prophecies uh, of the Old Testament, even in how he responded to uh, the rejection of the religious leaders. It's beautiful here talking about the bruised reed uh, along the rivers there in the Jordan and certainly in the area of the Nile. They have the reeds that grow and the winds blow, you know, mightily in these regions. And, and if a reed kind of bends over, 
by the wind. It has a weak spot. It forever has a weak spot. And, and it's vulnerable in that weak spot. And so here is Jesus, a bruised reed. He won't break. He comes to people. He comes in our weakness. He comes to our weak spots. And, and he won't break us or humiliate us because of our weakness. He comes to strengthen us. A smoking flax is a flax that's just got a little bit of smoke coming out of it. There's no flame. I mean, it's kind of like on its last legs. And Jesus doesn't come along and say, listen, if that's all that I can get out of your life is a little smoke, I'll snuff you. He doesn't do it. He comes along, blows on that flax until a flame is restored to that flax. And so uh, there's one group that didn't want anything to do with him. So he said, fine, I will go to those who need me and uh, know that they need me, and I'll care for them. And then uh, 1, verse 22, was brought to Jesus, who was demon-possessed. And as a result of his demon possession, he was blind and he was mute. And always in the Gospels, uh, Satan is, uh, you know, never glamorized or anything. It's a very stark picture that's painted of what he does to the lives that he is allowed to inhabit. And so you've got a demon-possessed uh, person here. He's blind and mute as a result of it. And so Jesus healed him, delivered him of the demon, so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. The reaction of the multitudes was that they were all amazed, verse 23, and they said, could this be the son of David? And so that is a term, an Old Testament term for the Messiah. They see what Jesus is doing. They're honest in their assessment at this point, and uh, they say this has got to be the Messiah. So the crowd is is moving uh, toward uh, continuing to move toward Jesus, understanding uh, who he is and what he's doing. And But then, verse 24, when the Pharisees heard it, heard the people saying, could this be the son of David? They're threatened by it. And they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. We would say uh, that their accusation against Jesus was, that he's casting out demons uh, under the power of the devil. That was the accusation that they made. Jesus knew their thoughts and uh, knew what they were thinking and whispering uh, uh, to one another. And he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If a kingdom begins to fight against itself, it has no hope of standing. It's going to collapse. Uh, it, it, and if Satan, verse 26, he takes the imagery of a kingdom or a household or a city and he applies it now to the kingdom of the devil. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. And how then will his kingdom stand? And so Jesus' response to them, they're saying that Jesus cast out this demon uh, under the power of the devil. And Jesus, first of all, responds to them by telling them that's completely illogical. You can accuse the devil of all manner of stupidity. You can accuse him of all manner of pride and blindness. But you can never accuse him of being stupid enough to fight against himself. He never masses his kingdom against another portion of his kingdom. One thing he does, and you've got to give him credit for it, is he always directs his resources against what is a danger to him. And so here Jesus is saying to them, it is utterly illogical to think that Jesus is going to give the power to deliver people from his kingdom and what he already has under his control. Then he uh, speaks in verse 27 and says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, that is the devil, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. He accuses them of being inconsistent in their uh, assessing of the ministry of delivering people of demons. It was very common in those days to have Jewish exorcists. We're going to get to uh, a a rather amusing, though very serious, uh, incident in the book of Acts one of these years. But there was, they had these traveling bands of Jewish exorcists, and so they would go out and they would, um, they would deliver people who were demon possessed or attempt to do so. And uh, so Jesus said, How come your sons 
cast out demons. And there is never, ever a question that the fact that, that the power is coming from God, I cast out demons, and now you come to a, a completely different conclusion. He's confronting them with their dishonesty and the fact that their heart really isn't uh, right in all of this. And he confronts them as it relates to all of this uh, publicly. He said in verse 28, and he identifies the means by which he did cast out the demons by the Spirit of God. He said, if, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how else can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Jesus said, this man has been delivered of his demon because someone greater than the devil who held this man has come on the scene. And it always requires a stronger man to deliver from a strong man. And so Jesus is saying the Spirit of God is in operation. That is the explanation for the fact that this man has been freed and the only logical conclusion concerning it. And uh, that's why this man, who is called Satan's goods, has been delivered from him. And then Jesus said in verse 30, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And he's communicating to the people that there's no neutrality concerning him. No neutrality. You're either for him or you're against him. There is no large gray area uh, that people think there is as it relates to him. And Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit, and here they have ascribed a work of the Holy Spirit to the devil. And so Jesus said, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, Whatever this sin is, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you don't want to do it. Because there's no forgiveness for it in this life, and there's no forgiveness for it in the life to come. I have a friend by the name of, uh, and this is, that's why it's called, elsewhere called the unpa uh, unpardonable sin. And I, had, I have a friend by the name of Joseph Perdome who came here and taught one Sunday, and he, as he was teaching on a Sunday morning, he uh, delved into this whole subject, and he's French-Canadian, and so he called it the unpardonable sin. <laughs> you know, you trust the French to even make the unpardonable sin sound good. But, uh, but it's a serious issue, something you don't want to be uh, guilty of because it can't be forgiven. Now, one of the things that the uh, unforgivable sin is not, or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not, it's not that before we came to know the Lord, we said something blasphemous against him, that we spoke against his name, that we stood out in the street in some kind of drunken state or angry state or whatever it might be, raised our fist up to heaven and blasphemed him, him and spoke against him. And a lot of times, many times over the years, I've known someone to come to know the Lord and because that was their attitude towards the Lord, before they came to know the Lord, then all of a sudden they start to read the Word of God. They read about this blasphemy of the Spirit. They realize what they've done against God in their, uh, before they became converted. And now they're concerned that they have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The problem with that, and, and the reason it isn't the blasphemy of the Spirit, there's a, a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is, is that I would never have a concern uh, as it relates to, you know, speaking against God prior to coming to know the Lord and anything that I might have said as it relates to the Lord in an injurious kind of way, except for the fact that the Lord has called me to Him 
And he's given me a soft heart towards the Lord in these things, which is an evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit. It just means I was a pagan before I came to know the Lord. And I was stupid before I came to know the Lord. And I didn't know what I was doing before I came to know the Lord. But it's not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this sin? One of the things that you have to do as it relates to uh, you, you different passages in the scripture where you look and you go, what in the world is going on here? Uh, you, you take, for instance, well, no, we won't go there. I don't want to. Uh, I have fun with myself here. Really, I do. Uh, every passage has a context. Every sentence is in the context of a paragraph. The paragraph is in the context of a chapter. A chapter is in the context of a book. The book is in the context of the entirety of the Bible. And every passage has to be interpreted under the weight of all of the rest of the Scriptures. And so what you do is you look at the Bible and you say, what is the one sin in all of the Bible for which there is no forgiveness in this life or in the life to come? And the one sin for which there is no forgiveness is a lifelong rejection of Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. A lifelong rejection of the ministry of the Holy Spirit who was given in order to convict me of my sin and lead me into a personal relationship with God. And a lifelong rejection of that ministry of the Holy Spirit and to die at the end of this life separated from his salvation, there is no forgiveness for that sin. One of the interesting things about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit here in this passage is he does not say they've committed it. He warns them concerning it. He hasn't said they committed it. He warns them about it. And here's why he warns them. By the time a man or a woman's heart is so hard against God, so unwilling to accept and acknowledge the truth concerning Jesus Christ, that I am willing to say that what Jesus Christ has done in the delivering of a man who is demon-possessed, to ascribe that to the devil rather than to the Holy Spirit is to reveal that I have a heart that is so dangerously hard that I am in great risk of living the rest of my life on earth, rejecting that gospel, the means by which I might be saved. He's warning them because their heart is so dangerously hard that they run that Risk And so the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he speaks about the seriousness of it, and he warns them because as he looks at their heart and says and, and, and sees it for what it is, he realizes they've almost to the point of no return in terms of how hard their heart is. In verse 33, he exhorts them and says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. And what he's saying to them is don't attribute the good fruit of this man being delivered to a bad tree. You either got a bad tree and bad fruit, or you got good tree and you got good fruit, but don't be mixing these things up. They knew what he was saying. And Jesus said, brood of vipers, and a viper was a very dangerous snake. You never wanted to, you know, <laughs> to be around them too much. They were dangerous. And he now speaks of the fact that they were the evil ones. They were the dangerous ones. You brood of vipers, and give the Lord credit, he spoke to their face. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Jesus was good, and that's why he brought forth good out of his life. And what he was saying and what he was doing, they were evil uh, as demonstrated by their works and by what was coming out of their mouth. And Jesus said, but I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they will give account of it. And the day of judgment 
For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. I don't know about you, but I'm not that eager to stand before the Lord for every idle word that I've spoken. And I've heard people preach on this toward Christians. Every idle word. (laughs) Oh, man. You're going to give an account for it, you know. Oh, my. I'm a dead duck. (laughs) But he's not talking to Christians. He's talking to rejectors. And he's talking about idle words in the sense of words coming out of the mouths of those who are in spiritual authority, which they had, or otherwise, where they use their words to stumble people from coming to a proper conclusion concerning Jesus Christ. So as it relates to the cults, as it relates to non-Christian religions, as it relates to the, you know, the atheist or whoever on the corner or whatever kind of antagonistic person toward the things of the Lord or people coming into a personal relationship with the Lord, they'll give an account for those idle words and the motive behind it will be brought forth in that day. But it's not talking about Christians. Everybody take a nice deep jack-o'-lane breath. Inhale, exhale, all right, there we go. Okay, verse 38. And then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want a sign from you. You want a sign from me? There's signs everywhere. That's why you're trying to kill me, because I keep doing these signs, and you're not happy with them. They just got, he just came out of a synagogue where he has healed a man with a hand that has been lame. He healed multitudes. They had signs. There was enough Signs given to believe that Jesus was the Messiah on the basis of the fact that when he came, he would do signs. So they wanted to see a sign. And Jesus is gracious with them. I mean, he's going to give them enough rope to hang themselves. He said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign that I'm the Messiah. And that's what they were asking for. He said, it'll be the sign of my resurrection. Uh, For three days and three nights, you'll think you're rid of me. (laughs) I'll be back. I'll be back. And of course, a resurrection was necessary Uh, for Jesus to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies because they spoke of the death of the Messiah, but then they spoke of this great kingdom that he was going to establish also. So it was necessary for there to be a death, but also for there to be a resurrection. And then he rebukes them in verse 41. He rebukes their unbelief when he says, The men of Nineveh, (laughs) the, the capital of Assyria, will rise in judgment with this generation and condemn them because Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. And so Jesus said, let me remind you of a couple of Old Testament characters that will rise up in judgment against you in your unbelief. When Jonah went into Nineveh, (laughs) he was a mess by the time he got there. I mean, you spend three days and three nights in the belly of just about anything, but certainly a great fish, you're going to be looking pretty bad. You're going to be looking bleached. You're going to be stinky. And the fish spits him up there on the shore. He makes his way to Nineveh, and he goes in there, and he just wants these people dead. The only good Ninevite was a bad, a dead Ninevite, and so that's what he wanted. And he went through the, the whole city and said, you know, and 40 days, and then comes destruction. No hope, no uh, grace, no salvation, no anything. You're all going to die. You're all going to die. <laughs> and he loved the message that he carried. <laughs> so he went through the whole. And what did Nineveh do? I mean, in the face of that completely hopeless and ungracious message, they repented. And here are the Jews and the leaders of the Jews who God is giving them a superior message and delivering it not by the mouth of a prophet, but by the Son of God Himself, they rejected it. And God said, you'll be judged for that. You'll be responsible for that. And then He calls the second witness, the Queen of Sheba, in verse 42, will rise up 
in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon was here. She rose up, traveled a great distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and here, they, here God didn't call them to go any great distance at all. He sent the Messiah to them, into their midst, to give them the wisdom of heaven and the superior wisdom, and still they rejected it. And Jesus is careful here in the two illustrations that he pulls out concerning Nineveh and the Queen of Sheba. They're both Gentiles. And he's saying people have, the Gentiles have responded better to less in their history than what you're doing to me. And they would have understood what he was saying. And then in verse 43, he said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and he finds none. So for some reason, you have a, a human body that was at one time uh, possessed by a demon. Somehow that demon has been uh, gone from that body and uh, the demon is apparently one of the things about demons is they're always looking for a body. They want to be in a body. They're not comfortable being a disembodied spirit. And so it's cast out of the one, out of the man. And uh, so the, the demon is searching around in different places for another, uh, another body to go into to find rest, finds none. And so the demon says to himself, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other demons, more wicked than himself. They all enter. Now you've got eight demons coming back into this body. They dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. And so it shall be with this wicked generation. And so um, here he's warning them, uh, the religious leaders and the nation as a whole. Uh, they are... Uh, their lives look neat, just like a house that's been swept and been cleaned. And so the demon has gone out of, out of the body. It's swept. It's clean. Religion can kind of offer that. But the problem is, is there's no protection to keep the demon from coming back into that body. There is only one protection against demon possession on the face of planet Earth, and that is for a human body to be inhabited by God himself, the greater than the devil. And so the importance of any of us here tonight, maybe you've grown up in religious systems, maybe you're in self-help programs, or maybe you think of yourself as a pretty good person, your life is tidy, it's neat, it's swept, and all of those things, you're completely vulnerable to the devil coming in, taking a demon coming in, taking possession of your life, bringing all of his buddies. There's only one protection against it, and that is to be indwelt by God himself. And so the warning to them of their rejection uh, of God and how it makes them now vulnerable uh, to the wickedness of the devil. And while he was still talking uh, to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside to speak with him. There's a great multitude around him. And then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside uh, seeking to speak with you. And he said, answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Chapter 13. And on the same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the sea and great multitudes. And please notice it's not just your average multitude. <laughs> it's great multitudes, plural. I mean, he's got a huge crowd around him were gathered together to him. And so, in order to teach them, he got into a boat and sat, cast off from the shore of the Sea of Galilee, kind of giving him the ability to speak to the crowd better. And uh, the whole multitude stood on the shore. And when he spoke, then he spoke many things to them in parables. And in chapter 13, you have a chapter that's called uh, the chapter that can 
contains the, the uh, parables of the kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus is going to speak to them now in parables. The word parable comes from two words in the, in the original, and it comes from our word English does. Uh, I mean, our word parable does in the English. It comes from the word para, which means uh, parallel, to lay beside uh, or to be beside, and then balo, which means to throw. And so a parable means to throw alongside. And what Jesus is going to do is he's going to take truths concerning the kingdom of God, spiritual truths that were hard for people to understand, for us to understand. And he said, I'm going to lay the spiritual truth down, but then I'm going to take a parable, something from the physical realm, throw it alongside the spiritual so that it will give insight into the spiritual by knowing what it is that he's talking about in the physical. And so he gives the first parable, the parable of the sower of the soils. And he said, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed the seed, and this is an image that would have been very familiar to them. You picture a guy, he's got a bag of seed, he's in his field, he's got all kinds of different soils. They would just take the seed and they would just broadcast it. They would just throw it. It would land all over the place. I mean, they would aim for the the best part of the field, but seed would go all over the place. And so a common agrarian society, common image of just broadcasting the seed. And so you picture it in your mind. He's gone out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is saying, listen, the parable is worth listening to and it's worth understanding. Well, the disciples in verse 10, and God bless them, they didn't understand what was going on here. And uh, they came to Jesus and they said, "Uh, why do you speak in uh, parables? And Jesus answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, that is, ears to hear, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, that is, ears to hear, uh, even what he has will be taken away. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So they ask, why are you speaking in parables? Why don't you just say these things straight out? Jesus gave them three reasons for the parables. First of all, in verse 11, it was in order to reveal the truth to the disciples. For those that really wanted to hear, these parables are astonishing in what they revealed to us. So that for the person that wanted to learn, they would be a revelation, like nothing else could be in terms of what he was communicating. But he, he also spoke in parables. The second reason was to conceal the truth from people who really didn't care about the truth, the despisers. The crowd is a, is a crowd made up of a large group of people are following him. They think that he's the son of David. They think that he's the Messiah. Uh, they're excited about what he's doing and what he's done in their life. And then you have a completely other group. You've got a whole mixture of two different types of people. You've got another group that hate his guts and they're planning the first chance they can get to kill him. That's what's going on. And so Jesus says, I'm going to speak in parables so that the group that wants to understand and count as precious what I'm saying will understand. But the group that has no interest in it at all, I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine as it relates to this. They won't understand the truths that are being spoken. And so that one crowd, they had rejected him. Uh, they were planning his death. They, they had rejected his miracles. They had rejected the fact that he had fulfilled prophecies. They had rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says, I'm not going to reveal any more truth to him. I'm not going to reveal any more truth to him. So I'm going to go to the parabolic method. And then the third reason 
that he spoke in parables was because Isaiah the prophet prophesied concerning the Messiah who was to come that he would speak in parables. And in them, verse 14, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing they will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is grown dull, their eyes are hard, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their heart and turn, so that I should heal them. And so the parable, it reveals or it conceals, depending upon the heart of the person that is listening uh, to the parable. The person that's interested in the truth, they'll find it a tremendous revelation. To those that aren't interested in the truth, they'll find that the parables are quite a mystery and they'll conceal the truth uh, from them. And Jesus said, but blessed to the disciples are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and didn't see it and to hear what you hear and didn't hear it. I mean, imagine if Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, <laughs> all these guys that prophesied concerning the Messiah who was to come, and here these guys are walking with the Messiah. They're listening to him. They're seeing all these things that these great prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of. And so the tremendous privilege that, that they had, even over the greatest of prophets in the Old Testament. And then in verse 18, Jesus gives the interpretation of the parable of the sowers. And he said, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Now, time out right there. I want you to hold your place in Matthew and turn over into Mark's gospel, chapter 4. Because there's a verse that's found there that is critical to understanding uh, the meaning of these parables and without it, we're not going to understand what these parables mean. Notice in Mark chapter 4, in verse 13, Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? And he's talking about the parable of, of the sower, or the parable of the soils. How then will you understand, notice the next word, all of the parables? And then he gives the interpretation of the parable. In other words, the imagery that he uses in this parable is critical to understanding the rest of the parables where he doesn't explain the imagery uh, and to get the right meaning of, of those parables. It's what is known as expositional constancy as it relates to the parables. So this parable is not only a parable, but it's the key to understanding all of the rest of the parables. If you sit here right now and you say, I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about, and I can't believe that that's important, just hold on for a couple more minutes and you'll discover that it is, because I'm going to call on uh, individuals to come up and teach on these uh, parables here that follow uh, uh, in just a moment. And therefore here, verse 18, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who received the seed by the wayside. And so the seed is the word of God, and the word of God is sown uh, by the sower. The Lord is the sower, or the Lord's uh, people are the sowers of the seed and of the gospel. And the seed that falls on the wayside, on the path, on the hardened surface, he said, this is the kind of person where the word hits a hard heart and the wicked one, that is the devil, comes and snatches the seed that was sown uh, in, in their heart. And so you have the first kind of heart, and Jesus is describing four kinds of, of hearts that the word of God gets sown into. And the first kind of heart is the hard heart. And there are people who are hard-hearted towards the things of the Lord. It doesn't, they don't care what, doesn't matter what arguments you use, no matter what you say to them, no matter how much time you use, their heart is hard toward it. They are not going to listen to you. And so you speak the things of the Lord into their life. It lays on the surface of their heart. They're not going to give it place in their life. And the devil, 
knowing the danger of that seed, the potential of a human life for who allows that seed of God's Word to penetrate their heart, knowing the danger of it, is only too happy to come into that life and accommodate them by quickly snatching up the seed and, and moving it out of the way. So there are some people, as it relates to the things of God, their heart is completely hard toward the, the things of the Lord. Now, don't give up on them, because God knows how to break up the fallow ground, the hard ground. We probably had some pretty hard-hearted people in this room. Don't shout out anybody's name. Don't nudge anybody next to you. But there's probably some people that were in that condition with a real hard, hard attitude towards the things of God, where you looked at them and said, the whole world will be saved before that person gets saved. And they end up saved because the Lord knows how to make us willing to listen to his truth. He won't force our, our will, but he knows how to make us willing. And he knows how to break up our hearts and humble us as it relates to, to receiving God's truth. Saul of Tarsus, classic example of it in the New Testament. And the Lord broke through. Everyone else could give up on him. But the Lord knew that ultimately he was going to come in. So that is the first kind of heart. And then there is in verse 20, the second kind of heart that is represented by the seed that went on the stony ground or the stony places. And this is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet it has no root in himself, but he endures only for a time. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, uh, immediately he stumbles. So in that part of the world. Lots of rocks in the ground. And so you would have this rocky kind of ground, and uh, it would look like soil on the surface, but immediately under the surface was rocky ground. The seed would be sown at a time in which the soil was moist. The sun would rise, it would begin to beat on things. Because it, it would, the rock was so close to the surface, it would produce Heat through the rock, the seed would germinate very quickly, and it would sprout up quicker than everything else, quicker than all of the seed that was planted on even the good ground. But the problem is, is that the ground was shallow. And so this is the kind of here that gives the word of God a shallow place in their life. It's the kind of person that on one night an altar call is given for them to accept the Lord. They accept the Lord, and they look like super Christian. For two weeks, for two months, for six months, it just they make the rest of us look like, what in the world are we doing? Are we some kind of, you know, carnal numbskulls or what? They're just, you know, going, growing like crazy. And then all of a sudden, it, it, the time comes where persecution and tribulation comes into their life, and all of a sudden, now when it costs them something to walk with the Lord, they fall away. They fall away. And so you've seen it in your own life where there's that kind of person that comes. They're so excited. There's this emotional experience. Their emotions have been touched, but their will hasn't been touched. There hasn't been a surrender to the Lord. I, tell you, I, am, I will take and I will go after the will over the emotions every single time. I, I don't like organs playing in the background. I don't like sappy stories. I like good stories that illustrate a point. But I'm not interested in producing a purely emotional response in a person to accept the Lord. Because it will never hold up with what's coming. The persecution that's coming. The trials that are coming. There has to be a thing where I make as a point in my life... I make a stand and I say, as an act of my will, I choose now to follow the Lord and make him the Lord of my life. And so there is this second seed, the second type of person. If that's what's happened to you, if you're here tonight and you go, that was me eight years ago. That's what you've just described me. Is there any hope for me? Yes, there is hope for you. And that is to make a commitment to him that isn't shallow tonight. To make one that isn't purely emotional, one that involves the will, where it just says, no matter what happens, Lord, I want to follow you at whatever expense to myself, and I pray that you give me the grace to do that, and and he'll do it. And then he describes the third um, type of heart or soil in verse 22, when he said, now he who received 
the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So here you have, uh, you know, uh, you have the hard heart and you have the shallow heart. And now you come to the crowded heart, the crowded heart. The word of God has gone into this life. It's like the, the seed has gone into the soil. The wheat has begun to come up out of the ground, but it never comes to a place of fruition. There's never fruit because the weeds grow up and they choke out the plant before it becomes fruitful. And this is an important uh, part of this parable as it relates to us. One of the greatest dangers that we face for fruitfulness in our lives is the choking out of God's word in our lives by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. They're weeds. They're weeds in a human life. They'll destroy what God has planted in our lives. What are the cares of this world? The cares of this world is to live my life concerned only about the cares of this world with no care for the world to come, no care for eternity. When I ask us tonight as Christians, we sit here tonight, is my life one that is characterized by only a concern for right now. I don't live for the next world. I don't live for eternity. My life isn't given to those things. I gotta look hard at my life. And so there is the cares of this world, but then there's the deceitfulness of riches. And it's a wonderful phrase that's, that's given there. Because riches lie. Riches lie. And the lie that riches speak into the life of anyone who will buy the lie. is, And so how many people in the body of Christ, the, sow, the seed went into their life? And you notice, I want you to notice there in, in verse 22, that at the last four words, uh, and he, one, two, three, yeah, and he becomes unfruitful. In other words, he was once fruitful. He was once fruitful. And now, because of the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, there is no spiritual fruit coming out of their life. And so the danger of being that kind of person where I've begun, I'm growing in the Lord, my life is being used for the things of the Lord, and then all of a sudden I start to get pulled away by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and it renders that life unfruitful. But then there's good news. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. And so there's the good news (laughs) that the soil does land on the, on, or the, the seed does land on good soil. And what is good soil? Good soil is the heart that isn't hard. It isn't shallow, and it isn't preoccupied with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And when that seed gets into that kind of a life, that's a life that brings forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Every single person is one of those hearers. All over this world, five and a half billion people on planet Earth. And every single person fits into one of those categories. And it's easy to talk about the whole world, isn't it? (laughs) Every single person in this room is one of those hearers, possesses one of those hearts. It's not a hybrid of this or that. That's what our hearts are. That's what they represent. But I look at my life, and I need to look at my life in light of the parable, and look and say, is my life fruitful? Is there fruit coming forth 30, 60, and 100 fold in my life? Am I growing in the Lord? Am I growing in Christ's likeness? Is the fruit of the Spirit coming out of my life? Is my life being used for eternal things? Is that the thing that is most important to me in my life? And so the importance of just allowing the parable to search our own hearts tonight and the importance of being the right kind of hearer. So here's Jesus speaking to this big old multitude of people and there's all kinds of hearers in there. And he knew it. There's all kinds of hearers today. So the test of life isn't uh, 
uh, appearances, the test of life is, is fruitfulness. I think that the parable is also important for us as Christians in that it is designed to be an encouragement. To be an encouragement to just keep sowing the seed. And so often, you know, here you are, you give vast amounts of your time to this person whose heart is hard. Or you give vast amount of your time to this person who, man, for six months it looked like they got shot out of a cannon. And now, who in the world is this person, you know, kind of thing. And and then, or you give your life to someone, they grow in the Lord, their life becomes fruitful, and then all of a sudden, by their own, the, the, you know, uh, decisions that they make and the desires of their own heart, they give themselves over to the things of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and, and all, and, and live a life just like everyone else in the world. And you think, well, what's the use? I mean, I'm just going to shut up the rest of my life. And it can be discouraging. But Jesus comes in and tells us ahead of time, this is the way that it's going to be. It's the way it's always been, and it's the way that it's always going to be. But don't forget, there are people who will listen, and they're waiting for the seed. And when they get it, it will hit a heart that is good soil and ready for the seed, and their life will bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And it is those people that make all of the rest of it uh, worth it. And so I think a beautiful, uh, you know, as Jesus just is very candid about what it means uh, to serve in the kingdom of God, to be a member of the kingdom of God, and to identify uh, what it is that we face in our own lives and then face in being a servant of the Lord. And so I think tonight, as we uh, close the service, I think it's important for us just to just to stop and look. Have you been a hard-hearted person towards the gospel? <laughs> you knew all the buttons to push when those Christians came. I mean, you're the most arrogant, loathsome excuse for a human being at, in, in those situations. Hard as can be, and yet God has broken up your heart in recent months and in recent weeks till you're in a place tonight that you're ready to receive the seed and move forward with the Lord. The Lord will receive you tonight. He'll save you tonight. He'll come into your life tonight. There'll be men and women up in front here immediately after the service. They'll be wearing a badge that says prayer so you can identify them easily. We'd love to pray with you tonight. If you're here tonight and you go, listen, That shallow, emotional kind of commitment, I recognize it. It is exactly what happened to me years ago. But believe me, I'm done with that. I really want to commit to the Lord tonight. Then come forward and we'll pray with you to make that commitment tonight. If you're here tonight and your life was once fruitful and it no longer is, and all of these things in life have just completely taken over, and you can't even remember what gifts God gave you, what His call upon your life is. There's a beautiful um, uh, illustration uh, concerning the king of Siam, which was uh, ancient, what is known today as Thailand. And the king of Siam, um, in that kingdom, only he was allowed to own a white elephant, And he was free to give these white elephants to whoever he wanted to give a white elephant to. And if you were a member of the kingdom of Siam and he liked you, he would give you a white elephant. And now you have a white elephant. It's your house, you know, and I mean, it's a sign of the king's pleasure and his favor as it relates to your life. And it's a great thing, you know, and, and you can't, and, and one of the things related to receiving a white elephant from the king of Siam is you are never free to get rid of it. You had to take care of it till it died. So if the king liked you, he gave you one white elephant. If he didn't like you, he'd give you another. And then he'd give you a third, and he'd give you a fourth, and he'd give you a fifth. Until all of your time and all of your resources would be spent in maintaining the white elephants. 
And it is a perfect way to completely waste a life. And what is true of the king of Siam, there are others that the devil himself will be perfectly happy to so fill our lives with the things that have nothing to do with God's call upon our lives. Keep us from that call. And these things become a curse to us. One of the interesting things about the flesh, at least mine, is that there is a tendency to accumulate just enough material things that it takes all of my time to take care of my material things. And it requires an act of my will and purpose to keep my life simple enough and unfilled enough with the things that I could fill it with in the world in order that I can have time to do what God has called me to do. And so it is with all of us. So it is with all of us. It might be a night where some of us look and say, yeah, I remember years ago I taught a Bible study and it grew like crazy and I was discipling people and you can't... E- I mean, Pastor, if you knew me 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you I mean, how God was using me. But all these other things came in. Repent. Just turn back. Where you were is there. You can go back there. The callings and the giftings of God are are without repentance. It's there so that our lives can be fruitful once again.